Good evening, Patriots, and welcome to another edition of the Douglas to Cody Show. You had many places to be tonight, but you chose to be here with me. And for that, I am forever grateful. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we had to skip last Tuesday's show because I was a little under the weather, but I'm feeling a lot better today. It was basically uh, the change in the seasons right now. Everything here in southeast Louisiana is green and yellow. Uh, pollen is everywhere, and uh, my allergies were kicking my butt big time. <laughs> so uh, feeling a lot better right now. Sadly, a bunch of other people are not. So uh, my hat's off to you. I understand how you feel. Trust me. So let's get right into tonight's show, shall we? First Lady Jill Biden has reportedly been privately urging President Biden to stop the war with Gaza or in Gaza, according to a conversation the president had with one of the attendees at a White House meeting with the Muslim community on Tuesday. That is correct. You heard me right. The Muslim community on Tuesday at the White House. A guest at Biden's meeting told the president that his wife disapproved of him attending the event over the Israel-Hamas war. And this was reported in the New York Times. Mr. Biden replied that he understood. The first lady, he said, had been urging him to stop it, stop it now. According to an attendee who heard his remarks, the outlet reported, the Times cited Samilia Suswell, the founder of the Black Muslim Leadership Council, who witnessed the back and forth, and told the paper it was striking to hear that the First Lady felt that way about the conflict. Biden hosted a small event at the White House with Muslim administration staffers and leaders of the Muslim community, who also joined the president for a dinner to break the fast during the Holy Islamic month of Ramadan. The president faced several protest uh, voices in the Wisconsin Democrat primary as he continues to face criticism over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. In the primary, 8.4% of voters selected the un instructed opinion rather than vote for President Biden, which amounted to almost 48,000 votes. Additionally, 17,553 votes, 3.1% were cast for Representative Dean Phillips, Democrat, Minnesota, who, by the way, is no longer even in the race. In Connecticut, the vote total for uncommitted was 11.5, just under 8,000 votes. In Rhode Island, 14.9% of voters were uncommitted, which totaled just under 4,000 votes. The First Lady was asked about the state of Biden's re-election campaign during an appearance on CBS Mornings this last Wednesday and was specifically questioned about a recent Wall Street Journal survey that found the Democrat incumbent trailing former President Donald Trump in six of the seven 2024 swing states. CBS host Tony DeRospel began asking the First Lady about the polling results before she cut him off. No, he's not losing in all the battleground states. He's coming up, she said before the host could finish asking the question. He's even doing better, she added. You know what? Once people start to focus and they see there are two choices, it's obvious that Joe will win this election. The First Lady was also asked if she was worried at all about President Biden's reelection efforts, responding, no, no, no. I feel that Joe will be reelected. The reference Wall Street Journal poll released Tuesday found that Trump is currently leading Biden in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and North Carolina states that will play a critical role in securing a win in the November ballot. The results found that Biden was tied with Trump only in Wisconsin, but did not secure any leads in the battleground states in any of the polls. So this tells me several things. First, I did not know you could catch a mental illness from another human being, did you? I know that you can catch things like viruses from each other. 
But Jill is called whatever is destroying Joe's mental capacity. Next, now the world sees firsthand the First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, along with the Black Muslim Leadership Council and Alejandro Mar and Rashid Tlaib and 99.9% .9 of everyone on the left support the terrorist organization Hamas over our ally Israel. Listen, war is hell. I know. I deployed overseas four separate times into combat operations in the United States military. And every war ever fought on planet Earth, innocent people will die. <clears throat> the Israel-Hamas war is no different. <clears throat> Mistakes are made, and that is regrettable. But that does not mean that you stop the war. The U.S. post 9-11 wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, and Pakistan have had tremendous human toll on these countries. But where's the left outrage for that? Per the Watson Institute, International and Public Affairs at Brown University, an estimate 432,000 plus civilians in these countries have died violent deaths as a result of the wars. As of May of 2023, an estimated 3.6 to 3.8 million people have died indirectly in post 9-11 war zones. The total death toll in these war zones could be at least 4.5 to 4.7 million and counting, though the precise mortality figure remains unknown. Civilian deaths have also resulted from U.S. post-9-11 military operations in Somalia and other countries. All of these deaths are a result of war. Innocent people die in war. But did America give up fighting these terrorists? No. Why? Because they will never stop trying to kill Americans and our allies. In the case of Israel and Hamas, Hamas uses innocent women and children as human shields, locating their command and control and weapons stockpiles in schools, mosques, hospitals, public buildings such as private and government buildings. So yes, sadly, people will die in that conflict, and they are. During World War II, 40 million civilians lost their lives due to U.S. and coalition bombing attacks. What would have been the end results if we stopped the war before winning the war because of these innocent lives? Today, well, we'd either be speaking Japanese or German. If we were to stop going after terrorists because of innocent lives, there is no doubt America would become a third world country and horrible things such as Sharia law would be in effect. Women and girls could not vote, drive or go to school. And your only choice of clothing women would be a black burqa covering your body from head to toe. And the same tragedies of war happened during the Vietnam War, operations just calls in Panama, World War I, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, and again, every war ever fought on planet Earth. But these are things the liberal left and our society never thinks about. And facts matter. Now all of a sudden, because the Muslim population is upset over what Israel is doing, way before any innocent lives were lost. They were already on the bandwagon against Israel retaliating against what happened. Folks, Israel and other countries like Egypt have attempted to get Hamas to come to the table and come up with a ceasefire, and they refuse to do so. If Israel stops before they eradicate all these terrorists, Guess what? 
They will regroup and once again kill innocent men, women, and children in Israel. But that's okay with many of those on the left. They don't care what happens to the Jews. Many of them even believe that the Holocaust never happened. That's how dumb they are. In war, innocent people die. That is a fact of life. There have been mistakes made, yes, in the war of Israel and Hamas. Yes, there have been some aid workers that have been killed recently. Yes, there have been schools attacked and places attacked that you would normally think you wouldn't attack, right? Except that's where the enemy's hiding and hoping that they will not be attacked. And in return, hoping for the sympathy of humans to join them against Israelis. Now, what did Jill Biden's comments do, if anything? Drum roll, please. Joe Biden warned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that U.S. policy in Gaza could change if the Israeli military doesn't do more to improve the humanitarian situation. During a phone call with his Israeli, Israeli counterpart, Biden stressed that Israel's strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation are unacceptable. According to a White House readout of that actual call. Although those strikes were not carried out on purpose, and again, accidents happen in war, Joe Biden's same sentiment was echoed later today by both Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby, with Blinken telling reporters that the U.S. would shift gears if we don't see the change that we need to see, according to a report from the Jerusalem Post. Let me stop for a second. When Joe Biden was vice president of the United States under Barack Obama, innocent men, women, and children were killed in the thousands in places like Afghanistan, Syria, and every conflict that they got us involved with. This is no different. Where was the outrage then? Obama got many, Obama even targeted and killed American citizens with drone attacks because, oh, and I agree they should have been killed because they were part of terrorist organizations. But where was their outrage then? It wasn't. Meanwhile, Kirby warned that the changes in Israeli policy need to change within hours and days and that the administration was expecting to announce soon what they're going to do about Israel. The president made very clear his concerns. The prime minister acknowledged these concerns, Kirby said. According to the White House readout of the call, Biden stressed the need for an immediate ceasefire, urging such a move would be essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. The 30 minute call came after seven aid workers with the World Central Kitchen were killed by Israeli airstrikes this week, adding a growing concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza as Israel's siege on the small strip of land has continued over the past five months. And again, they're retaliating because they were attacked and innocent men, women, and children were not only killed, but kidnapped and tortured. But yet they're not allowed to defend themselves. Israel has said, and I support them 100% with this statement, we will not stop until every Hamas terrorist no longer is alive. And 
even if the United States stands with us or against us. They're on record saying that just a few days ago. The two leaders also discussed Iranian threats against Israel, with the White House stressing that Biden made clear that the United States strongly supports Israel in the face of those threats. Nevertheless, Kirby stressed the need for Israel to change how it is approaching the current invasion. What we want to see are some real changes on the Israeli side, Kirby said. And if we don't see changes from their side, there will have to be changes from our side, meaning we will no longer support Israel. All this comes at a time of Israel report on Thursday, claimed Hamas appeared to reject an Egyptian proposal for a ceasefire. Now mark my words, if we were not seven months from a presidential election and Joe Biden was not trailing in the polls, and the left was not screaming at the top of their lungs that they won't vote for Joe Biden if he doesn't stop this war. Joe Biden would not have made this call today. He would stand by Israel as he's always done in the past. But now it's reached all the way up to the person that shares the bed with him, Jill Biden echoing, this war must stop. All it will do if they stop is more Israeli citizens will be killed and the terrorists will flourish like they are in Afghanistan, for instance, when Joe Biden roughly pulled us out of there and left behind billions of dollars worth of military equipment to be used again on the battlefield to kill American service members. This administration is slowly but surely killing us and the world. Everything that the left claimed Trump would do if, if elected, Biden did, not Trump. Trump didn't get us into any extra wars. Look at us now. Our borders completely unsecure. Terrorists are coming across it on a regular basis. They're going to be striking right here in America soon, my friends. The FBI, Homeland Security are working their ass off to try and disrupt that. And what is the Biden administration doing to stop it? They're blaming Congress for their own actions of reversing all the policies that Donald Trump had in place on that southern border. Now speaking of Joe Biden's mental illness, Biden touted the best economy in the world this past Monday in an interview and urged people were going to turn out and vote in 2024 because they're sick of negativity. <laughs> Our Roker interviewed Biden on NBC's Today Show and asked Biden to respond to people who might be hesitant about voting in the 2024 election. Joe said, I think people are going to be surprised. People are going to surprise us. They're going to engage. We have an overwhelming response while we're on the road. Look, we have tens of thousands of people contributing $5, $10 a pop, he said. We have opened up 100 headquarters across the country. We have people waiting to just get engaged. I just think people are so tired of the negativity and the propaganda that they just want to get engaged. Joe, <laughs> you haven't given a single speech yet to include the last presidential run-up for election where more than 100 people showed up to listen to you. So 100 people show up and support your crazy radical left policies and you want to blame that or say that that is an engagement of the American people? That's how you judge it? And furthermore, we have the best economy in the world under your leadership? Are you smoking Hunter's crack? They won't. 
to see change things. I'm optimistic. I really am, Biden responded. <laughs> yes, sir, they sure do want to see change. Roker followed up with a question about the economy and people who are uh, feeling, aren't feeling good about the economy situation. Well, I'd like to see, we have the best economy in the world right now, Joe Biden said. We have to make it better, yes. We really do have the best economy in the world, Biden said again. He then referred to the latest impact on the pandemic. Jobs are up more than they have ever been. We're in a situation where the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years is maintained. And the Democrats keep saying about all these people that are getting jobs now. Look what we've done, all the jobs we've created. No, you stupid son of a bitches, you haven't created anything. These are jobs that people left during the COVID pandemic that are now going back to work because the government has cut off the tit and you've got no way of funding your bills anymore. So you have to go back to work. The best economy in the world. We have people, just, but people, look, I think we're going to find out that what happened was a consequence of the crisis we had in health. It's going to have a lasting effect. We just have to get people to move again. We're ready. We will come together in a way that, I mean that sincerely. I'm truly optimistic, the president continued. Did that make any sense to you, what I just read? First Lady Jill Biden stood alongside the president for that interview, primarily to make sure he doesn't fall flat on his damn face, as he's done many times. And Roker asked how she was feeling about the election. <laughs> and she responded, I feel great. I've been traveling across the country. People are ready to go. And we're going to win this, she said. All the latest polls released found that over half of voters feel they're worse off today than they were in 2020. You can't escape that, Joe and Jill. You can lie all you want. We see the polls. The polls also found that 73% or 73 of voters rate the economy negatively, which is a slight improvement compared to May of 2023 when 83% of voters rated the economy negatively. Only 38% approve of Biden's handling of the economy and 61% disapprove the polls find. All polls point to the economy, election integrity, immigration, and health care as the top issues for voters as they decide which presidential candidate to support, with nearly half or more saying each is extremely important. Fewer feel that way about abortion, foreign policy, and climate change. Maybe Jill is also involved with some of Hunter's crap. Uh, how else can you come up and say shit like this? Do you think we don't have access to the internet? Or TV? You think we're living in caves? Many Americans feel they are because the economy is so screwed up under this administration. And then you come out and lie about it like you do everything else. Remember the report I did recently on the stampede at the border? where a bunch of illegal immigrants overwhelmed the Army National Guard and injured many. That was just recently. Well, a bunch of those were arrested and charged with not only illegal entry into America, but attacking National Guard troops and law enforcement. Well, did you know this past Easter Sunday, an El Paso judge overruled 
and ordered the release of those illegals accused of involvement of the border riot when a stampede overwhelmed National Guard troops along the Rio Grande just last month. The El Paso Times reported, Judge Humberto Acosta made his ruling on Sunday, March 31st, during an online teleconference bond hearing in which he accused the El Paso District Attorney's Office of not being ready to proceed with detention hearings for each defendant, according to the outlet. It is the ruling of the court that all the writing participation people cases will be released on their own reconnaissance, Acosta ordered. Twitch, by the way, they will never be seen again. They will just mix into American society like the other millions are doing until they get caught with another crime. The riot happened on March 21st when a group of more than 100 illegals attempted to enter the U.S. by rushing border fence in an area southern border of El Paso, Texas. Video footage published by the New York Post shows dozens of adult men ripping away razor wire that had been set up by the state and the National Guardsmen. Then they ran towards a section of the border wall where they were blocked from entering further and arrested. It is unknown how many illegal immigrants were booked on a charge of riot participation. But the El Paso Times reported that Acosta mentioned hundreds of arrestees were entitled to individual detention hearings within 48 hours. <laughs> it was also unclear if the judge's ruling applied only to the riot participation charges and not to assault and criminal mischief charges related to the border stampede. So if the DA's office is telling me that they're not ready to go, what we're going to do is we're going to release all of these individuals on their own reconnaissance. Costa said at the hearing, Brandon Judge, president of the National Border Patrol Council, previously has told in many interviews that agents were going through video to see who assaulted the guardsmen. They will be processed for deportion, but maintain the ability to claim asylum. Texas also has the ability to charge the migrants who assaulted them, and they should. Texas has said it still has the authority to stop those coming across illegally by using trespass laws. Governor Greg Abbott's spokesperson, Andrew Mahallers, previously told the news media, the surge today, this was on Thursday, March 21st in El Paso, is a direct result of the unsustainable chaos President Biden has unleashed on the border. Texas Military Department of the Texas Department of Public Safety quickly gained control of the situation and are working to repair the damage caused by the illegal immigrants. These illegal immigrants committed crimes in Texas. They committed crimes against law enforcement and Army National Guardsmen. Department of Public Safety is under instructions to arrest every illegal immigrant involved for committing criminal trespass and destruction of property. The Supreme Court briefly allowed Texas an anti-illegal immigration law, which allows police to arrest illegal immigrants to go into effect despite a legal challenge from the Biden administration. The law was kicked back down to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which then blocked it again hours later as arguments proceeded on the merits. The Biden administration has said the law interferes with federal responsibility over immigration enforcement. Number one, we're facing such dangerous situation. And number two, Joe Biden, through his actions, is violating the laws of the United States of America, Abbott said following the stampede, because the federal government is not doing their job. In the heart of America's long-standing debate on gun control, 
the enhancement of assault weapons bans across various states have ignited a firestorm of controversy and impassioned discourse. These legislative actions aiming to curtail the prevalence of military stall firearms in civilian hands has become battlegrounds for a clash between advocacy for public safety and the defense of constitutional rights. Critics and supporters alike wield statics, uh, statistics, constitutional arguments, and emotional appeals, making the decision around these bans a multifaceted as it is heated. Conversation transitions more policy, uh, touching the very core of American values and society, safety, making it a polarized yet critical debate in the nation's quest for freedom and security. California's ban on assault-style weapons began back in 1989, making it one of the earliest states to adopt such legislation. The state prohibits the possession, manufacture, sale, and important uh, import of specific models and firearms with certain features, including rifles, shotguns, and pistols. Critics argue that these laws infringe on the Second Amendment rights and punish responsible gun owners rather than addressing the root cause of gun violence. Following the Sandy Hook school shooting in 2012, Connecticut expanded its assault weapons ban, which originally went into effect in 1993. The law now includes a ban on the sale of over 150 specific assault weapons and limits high capacity magazines to 10 rounds. Opponents of the ban er, uh, argue that it restricts the freedom of law-abiding citizens and questions the effectiveness of such measures in preventing gun violence. Delaware's assault weapons ban, enacted in 2022, includes restrictions on possession, manufacturing, sale, transfer, and receipt of assault-style weapons. Critics of the ban contend that it violates individual constitutional rights and suggests it does not directly address issues related to gun crimes and mass shootings. Since 1992, Hawaii has banned the possession, manufacture, sale of other transfer or of assault weapon style weapons with restrictions applying primarily to pistols such as nine millimeters. The state's isolated geographic is often cited for a reason for strengthening gun control laws. However, opponents argue that the ban impacts rural farm owners and hunters disproportionately to challenge the particulars of the such restrictions. And you know, it doesn't matter that it's an island change out in the middle of the Pacific. Remember when they were attacked during World War II by Japan? Illinois' ban on assault weapons, uh, stall weapons went into effect in 2023, targeting possession, manufacture, sale, and purchase. Critics of the ban highlight the low compliance rates among existing gun owners and raise concerns about the effectiveness of the law in reducing gun violence, suggesting that it instead imposes undue burden on lawful gun owners, and it does. Maryland's law, enacted in 2013, bans the sale and transfer of assault weapons and high-capacity magazines holding more than 10 rounds. The legislation allows those who own such guns before the ban to keep them a compromise that critics argue does little to address existing weapons while infringing on new purchases. Massachusetts has had what is considered one of the nation's strictest assault weapons bans since 1998. The law restricts the sale of weapons and high capacity magazines beyond 10 rounds. Critics argue that the intensive licensing requirement and paperwork to tier lawful gun owners without providing clear benefits to public safety. New Jersey's assault weapons ban was enacted in 1990 and strengthened in 2020 or 2018, requiring registration of previously purchased assault weapons. Critics argue that the requirement for registration and the potential for felony charges for non-compliance or punitive measures that infringe on the individual's rights without evidence of significant impact on gun violence. In response to the mass shootings in Buffalo, New York, enact the Security Ammunition and Firearms Enforcement Act, which includes the ban on the private sale of assault weapons. The law has faced 
criticism for its potential impact on upstate residents who are generally more opposed to gun violence measures and questions about its overall efficiency in preventing gun-related incidents. Washington's restrictions, which are tightened in recent years, include a ban on the sale or transfer of semi-automatic rifles with at least one military-style feature. Critics uh, argue that such definitions, the restrictions infringe on the rights of gun owners without addressing the underlying issues of gun violence. The term assault weapon is broadly and broadly defined, making bans difficult to enforce. Legislation also focuses on cosmetic features rather than functionalities that impact firearms uh, abilities. This ambitious uh, ambition can lead to loopholes where functionality similar firearms remain legal to minor deficiencies and different appearances. Assault weapons bans typically do not address the vast number of such firearms already in circulation. Laws that allow existing owners to keep their assault weapons do little to reduce the overall number in public hands. Critics argue that without mechanisms to reduce existing stockpile, new bans have limited impact on gun violence. In fact, I say they have none. Bans on specific types of firearms do not address the root cause of gun violence in any way, shape, or form, such as mental health issues, economic disparities, and social factors. Critics argue that focusing on weapon type diverts attention and resources for more effective violence prevention measures. This approach may fail to achieve significant reductions in gun-related crimes or mass shootings. And again, if somebody can't get their hands on a AR-15 or an AK-47, they can get a shotgun and do just as much damage. Or they can get an airplane or a jet and fly it into buildings for crying out loud like we saw 9-11. Or... How many times have you heard me right here on this show talk about mass stabbings that are taking place because the person couldn't get a gun, so they went and got a knife and went in and started stabbing people to death. High noncompliance rates and challenges in enforcing assault weapons bans weaken their effectiveness. In jurisdictions with strict gun laws, the reports of low registration rates among owners of firearms now classified as assault weapons. And by the way, let me just back up for a second and say, there's no such thing as an assault weapon. It doesn't exist. Unless you want to say that, oh, I don't know, this is an assault pen. Because if I take this pen and I stab you with this pen, I'm assaulting you. So anything can be considered an assault type item. If I hit you in the head with this cell phone, it's an assault phone. Well, especially since it's black. That's the main thing they don't want is any black firearms. The difficulty in tracking non-compliance owners and the resources required for enforcement further complicate the practical application of these laws. In conclusion, the debate over assault weapon bans in the United States and capitalizes the border struggle over how to balance individual rights with collective safety. As states implement and refine these laws, they negative a complex landscape shaped by legal challenges, cultural differences, and divergent interpretations of the Second Amendment. Critics and proponents alike continue to scrutinize the effectiveness of such bans, sparking discussions that reach far beyond the specifics of legislation that touch on fundamental questions about violence, liberty, and the nature of responsible society. Ultimately, the uh, controversy surrounding assault weapons bans reflects enduring tension in American democracy, underscoring the ongoing search for policies to protect both public safety and individual freedoms. The bottom line, it does not matter what laws 
or past. The only way the laws affect any human is if they are law-abiding citizens. Those that are not don't give two shits about the laws you pass. They're still going to go out and commit crimes against other humans because they're criminals. Criminals don't obey laws. It's like having all these gun-free zones all over the place. For what purpose? You ever notice, liberals and Democrats, that that's where the gun violence has taken place? In gun-free zones? How many mass shootings were stopped in schools because the person, when they got there, realized, oh, this is a gun-free zone. I can't go in there with my gun, so I'll turn around and go home. Never. Never. Criminals do not care what laws you pass. You're only affecting law-abiding citizens. But... Your mental capacity is that of Joe Biden on crack. Hunter's crack, by the way. I think he's got some special shit stashed away. That he's given to many in this current administration. Because if you haven't noticed, they're saying and doing some things that just defy all common sense. Things that you couldn't make up if you tried. You know, an administration that not only likes to make up the game as they go along and do whatever it takes to make things harder on law-abiding citizens, or conservatives, Republicans, doing things such as, well, let's see, the latest was making... Easter Sunday, a day of drag queens. Now, I will tell you, if you didn't know this, it just so happened that Easter Sunday fell on March 31st. Since Joe Biden took office, he made it that day. And this year it fell on Easter. Um, That's not something new. It's been recognized for many, many years. But yes, those on the right are making a bigger deal out of it than it is. You got a million different things you can, you know, argue about Joe Biden. Lord knows I have. But this is one that's just went a little too far because not only did he's not responsible for Easter Sunday being, oh, let's recognize transsexuals, but it's not his doings. It just so happens that Easter every year doesn't fall on the exact same date. But March 31st is always March 31st, regardless of what day it is, which changes every year. So there you go, left and Democrats. I gave a shout out to you because there are some on the right that are too stupid to see that. Now, I, for one, If you watch this show, you know how I feel about those that dress up in drag. And you know how I feel about, well, at least those that dress up in drag and try and push that shit on our children in schools and in libraries and drag queen story hour. What you do at home in the privacy of your own home with another consenting adult, if you want to dress up as Barney the Purple Dinosaur or dress up as a freaking dog, or dress up as a in a drag queen, I don't care. I'd imagine to say that probably 100% of conservatives and Republicans could give a shit what you do behind closed doors. But when you bring that shit out in public and you push it on our children, then we care. And because it happened to fall on Sunday, that's why so many on the right got so pissed off but they didn't do their homework to realize this this ain't had shit to do with Joe Biden other than 
he went out and said, you know, March 31st will be the day that we recognize trans people. Well, that was already put in place. His brain just doesn't function to do that, to understand that. Then, of course, he turned around the next day when questioned about it and said, I didn't do that. As if he didn't know that he made that as the day, signed into law, that we will recognize him. Well, guess what? When March 31st falls around next year, guess what it won't fall on? Easter. Do you get it? I hope so. <laughs> Anyhow, folks, you have many places to be tonight. You chose to be here with me again for that. I am forever grateful. Thank you very, very much. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this channel. Also, check out DouglasDakota.com. And uh, the other places you can follow us on social media are in the description of this video when it comes up as a regular video instead of the live show. And all my live shows and all my videos that are posted. You can see all the different places you can follow me, other places you can see the live show besides YouTube. We're going out live now on YouTube, on Rumble, on X, on LinkedIn, uh, just to name a few. And we're going to be bringing on many more in the near future. Eventually, we'll tell YouTube to go shove this platform up their ass, which I can't wait to do and be completely done with it because they are run by Google and Google is run by who? Far left liberals that like to censor the shit out of everything that you say. So therefore, this is not the right place for people like me that aren't politically correct. As always, please say a prayer for our men and women serving the United States military, our veterans, our law enforcement officers, our first responders, and their families. Our angel families, our blue and gold star families in our country. And if you do not know what blue and gold star families are, or you do not know what angel families are, Please look that up because they need our support now more than ever before. Because this current administration is literally pissing on the graves of their loved ones. And that, my friends, is unacceptable behavior. It is appalling the way this administration views angel families and blue and gold star families. Whatever you do this weekend, please be safe. Please watch your six. Watch out for your family and friends. Be safe. Have an enjoyable weekend. I know I will. We have a reunion coming up this Saturday for all of us skydivers that used to jump out of airplanes uh, quite some time about back with uh, Green County Sport Parachute Center and Greenway Sport Parachute Center. We're looking forward to getting together. We do this every year. This is our seventh reunion. We get together and share stories and uh, good food and good drink and good, good company. So I'll be doing that this weekend. And uh, whatever you're doing, please enjoy yourself. And I'll see you back here next Tuesday for another edition of the Douglas Dakota Show. Until then, take care, everyone, and God bless.